Welcome everyone to the Ecology Evolution Seminar Series hosted by the School of Biological Sciences at the University of Adelaide. Today we are hosting another amazing group of researchers. If you have missed the first round, it's on YouTube. Just follow the QR code you see on the screen. It will take to the website and you can um, watch the series if you have missed the first one. Um, I'm Ayesha Gubirand. I am the co-convener of the seminar series and the researcher here at the University of Adelaide. Uh, Bastian Yamas is the co-convener today. He is an associate professor and an ARC Future Fellow affiliated with the Australian Centre for Ancient DNA, also known as ACAT, which is one of the leading ancient DNA research centres in the world. Uh, you will have to join us in August to hear more about Bastian's work. Our team includes Wendy Warren, Matt Bowie and Jasmine Packer, who are doing amazing research here at the University of Adelaide and have been volunteering to facilitate this series. We also would like to thank Sam Legolu for designing the website and all the promotion materials. As a team, we would like to acknowledge and pay our respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of this ancestral lands that we are hosting this webinar from. We would love to know where you're joining us from, so please let us know in the chat line. Um, you can use the chat line to ask questions. If we run out of time and cannot address your questions, feel free to contact us or the speakers. Um, you can find the details again on the website. Um, in our winter series, we are celebrating 150th anniversary of Charles Darwin's book, The Descent of Man and Selection in Relation to Sex, which was published in 1871. A truly revolutionary book continuing to impact our understanding on human evolution, as we heard in June, and we will continue to hear more. It's truly a fascinating time to be studying human evolution as our understanding is challenged almost on a daily basis with new data that emerge. Um, and the research on human origins is inherently transdisciplinary, so we have um, lots of speakers from different fields. Today our speakers are Dr. Luca Fioranza, Mehmet Somal, and Joao Teixeira, who are joining us from Australia, Turkey, and Portugal. We are very thrilled to have all of them here with us today. In the first hour, we are going to have all three talks one after the other, each of which is going to be 20 minutes. And after the talks, we will have a combined Q&A or a discussion session where we will address the questions you have for the speakers. So um, use the chat line. Um, I'll start by introducing our first speaker, Dr. Luca Fioranza. Luca received his bachelor's and master's degree in natural sciences at La Spianza University in Rome and completed his PhD in biological sciences between the Goethe University and Seckenberg Research Institute in Frankfurt. During his doctoral degree, he was part of the European Virtual Anthropology Network, where he mastered cutting edge techniques for the study of anatomical variability, including medical imaging, 3D digitization, display, modeling, and programming. Luca is currently the head of Paleodialet Research Lab at Monash University, and his research focuses on the functional morphology of the masticatory apparatus in human and non-human primates, and on the importance of role of diet in human evolution. He has published um, his research in high impact journals such as Nature and Nature Ecology and Evolution as well as high impact anthropological journals. He has been listed among the Australia's top researchers by the Australian Research 2020 magazine as leader in the field of anthropology. Thank you Luca for joining us and also allowing us to use your stunning image for the series. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I can start sharing my screen for my talk, which is be the, basically the same image that you've seen in the presentation of the seminar. Okay, um, so today we are going to talk about the impact of seasonal changes on growth and development in Australia's Africans. But first of all, we need to make an introduction about uh, primates. So primates are uh, a little bit uh, unique uh, uh, compared to other mammals because they have a very long lifespan, they have a relatively low reproductive rate, and at the same time they also invest a lot of uh, energy in uh, parental care. But there is also variation uh, across different primate species. Uh, here is shown the life history traits of different primates. And for life history, uh, this means uh, a series of events that are related to survival and reproduction, that occur in the life of individuals between uh, birth and uh, death. So for example, if we look on a uh, lemur uh, uh, and, and we compare with the chimpanzee, we can see that the, the, um, 
the gestation in infantile and juvenile period are relatively shorter, significantly shorter compared to the chimpanzee. And then we can see also the modern humans, uh, they have very long lifespan uh, and everything is delayed from uh, uh, the uh, achievement of the first reproductive age and also uh, all the other period from the infantile and juvenile. Uh, oops. So one important, uh, um, um, oops. So sorry, uh, one important, uh, one of the key uh, life um, uh, life uh, history uh, traits is a certain uh, a winning. Winning is the gradual replacement of milk by solid food. Uh, and uh, if we look on the uh, on the age of uh, of uh, uh, the winning in different uh, uh, Asian and African apes, and we compare with modern humans, we can see a high, a really strike difference. In fact, orangutan can uh, win uh, the age of winning up to seven years, which is one of the longest in uh, mammal, mammal, uh, mammals. And also gorilla and chimpanzee can vary between four and five years of age. Um, these have a, a, very, a very significant impact on the uh, reproductive rate of the species. What does it mean this? Because by prolonging the winning uh, age, they also extending the interbirth uh, interval, uh, which meaning is the period of time within two consecutive births. So meaning that orangutan female, uh, before to give birth, need to have the uh, young becoming independent. So if you're uh, winning the baby till uh, or the young till seven years of age, it means that the, the female can only repro reproduce again after that time. But modern humans is a little bit uh, unique because it show all uh, traits that are typical of, of a very slow uh, life, I, you know, very long uh, maturation, uh, very long infantile and juvenile period, and so on. But on the other hand, uh, when we look on the winning age, uh, um, this is very more typical of a fast life. In fact, uh, modern humans in pre industrial society that were winning the, the youngs up to 2.5 years of age, which is considerably shorter compared to uh, other uh, Asian and African apes. This meaning that also the, uh, the fertility rate is much higher in modern humans compared to uh, great apes. So for that reason, it's very important to establish the age of winning because it can give important information about the ecology, evolution, and a biology of a species. But what's about our human ancestor? Uh, do they look like more like uh, 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 great apes or they're more uh, modern human-like? Uh, so we're going to investigate that. Uh, in order to do that, we need to also understand how we can measure the growth rate uh, of hominid. So uh, um, the, we focus on the analysis of the dentition, and this for two main reasons. First, in how the tooth are formed. So the dental tissue are very unique uh, 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 feature is like the, 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 the tissue is basically formed layer by layer uh, at a regular pace. What does it mean? That you know, we can like work like a clock, biological clock. So we can, uh, by uh, determine this, uh, you know, measure this growth, we can also establish the onset, the duration, and offset of the cellular activity. Um, when we talk about this, we need to think about more like uh, uh, the ring uh, of a tree. So if we cut the tree and we look on the, on the trunk, we can see that we can determine the age of the tree by counting the, the rings. Also, what we can do by looking at the shape and also the, the color, we can see, for example, we can identify period of uh, stress or period, uh, like in this case, where the enamel, I'm sorry, the enamel, so the tree rings are much shorter. Uh, while here we have much wider because this correspond to wetter uh, period. In a similar fashion, we can do this also with the dentition. If we look on the on the tooth, we can see that there are two different types of, of um, incremental growth line. We have short period incremental growth lines that are called a cross reaction, and they are produced at a daily basis. And then we also have a long term incremental growth line, which are called a rhesus line. Uh, which 
in model human, they, they are the form every seven, eight to eight days. Uh, and when they reach the standard surface of the tooth, they are called a perichimata. So in this case, it's like if we think about the 3D printing that is the forming the 3D prints layer by layer in a similar fashion happen also with the, with the tooth animal and other dental uh, tissue. Uh, by counting, measuring, we can basically determine some events that occur during the lifetime of an individual, also establish the, the birth and also the, the age of death in case the individual died before reaching a maturity. The other uh, key feature of, uh, of the enamel is that uh, uh, it's also preserve a permanent record. What does it mean this? That the, also the chemical composition of the uh, that is surround us, for example, the air that we breathe, the food that we eat, or the water that we drink, we incorporate trace elements from the environment and they're part of our body. Now, the advantage of, uh, of study the dentition is that the enamel doesn't regrow. So you preserve a permanent record of what happened during the early, uh, early years of their life. Something that doesn't happen with bones, which is a dynamic tissue and tend to remodel uh, all the time. So basically by combining this approach, like the timing and the chemical composition, uh, we can determine, for example, if certain element, uh, how they are distributed to time and associate these elements to certain type of food. There has been a study uh, uh, relatively recently that uh, uh, identified as the barium uh, um, provide information about the consumption of milk. So they have been studied using uh, captive macaques, also human children. And basically what they found is that uh, before uh, birth, the level of barium is very low, but soon the, after birth, uh, this level of barium increased significantly. Uh, and then start to slowly decrease when the baby starts to introduce solid food to disappear when the milk is completely re uh, replaced by solid food. And basically we can map this uh, element, trace element on the section of the tooth and basically establish how this level of a certain element can vary through time. So we can time exactly, and, and we can see that there is a, uh, here the neonatal line, so when the, uh, the individual is born, and then there is an increase of, uh, of, uh, of the barium level. And you can see also from this graph. Barium is important because uh, it's similar to calcium and follow the same blood streams. And for that reason, it's also bioavailable and making ideal candidate to uh, uh, reconstruct uh, the nursing behavior of, a, of, a, of, a, of an individual. It has been employed on Neanderthal. Uh, related to human fossil and I even found out that Neanderthal were breastfeeding their babies in a similar fashion of modern humans in pre-industrial society up to two uh, to three years of age. Uh, so very similar to modern humans. So what we've done with our study is like to use the same approach but going back up two million years in particular we focus on the analysis of uh, the dentition of Australopithecus africanus. Uh, that live uh, uh, from Sterk Fontaine, that is dated between 2.6 to, to 2.1 million years ago. So, who is the Australopithecus africanus? So, uh, re in relation to, they live in very um, uh, seasonal environment, characterized by a long, uh, dry season and alternate with wet period with the increase of rainfall. And it seems that the he was uh, not a picky either. He, he used to eat a little bit of a different food that would range from uh, hard object uh, food like uh, seeds, uh, roots, and so on, but also fruit, leaves. So he also included tough foods in their diet. So he was a little bit more complex, for example, compared to uh, Paranthropus robustus or Paranthropus uh, boisiae. So for this study, we analyzed, in, uh, we analyzed two specimens, STS-51 and STS-28, and in total were four uh, active. Um, we brought, we picked these fossils in, in South Africa, and then we brought here in Australia, and then I give them to Renault Johannes Boyau, that is uh, uh, the, uh, the first order of this paper. Uh, and then he basically cut the tooth in half, 
and then with the with the mass with the laser ablation uh, and the ablated material then has been analyzed to the mass spectrometer, and we focus on different trace elements uh, uh, ranging from the strontium, uranium, calcium, lithium, and of course the barium. So one thing I need to mention that uh, unfortunately the timing uh, to uh, to do the proper timing and reconstruct the, all these uh, sequential events for do, to do that you need to do uh, use a destroying I mean like a, a destructive approach so you need to take a thin as uh, slides of the tooth and then analyze it this was not possible for that reason uh, we try to uh, predict. Um, the timing using publishing data and basically we, here you can see a few uh, a dotted line which is the breastfeeding peak and the end of uh, uh, milk predominance and then we took the the distance to uh, uh, the distance calculate uh, the the time based on the calcification rate from previous study so what we see in here is that in sts51 for example uh, we have a breastfeeding peak that uh, occur around nine months and then uh, the end of, uh, of milk predominance uh, correspond to 12 months. Similar value have been found also in STS 28, where we found that uh, uh, the peak of breastfeeding peak was around six to nine months, and the end of milk predominance was around 13 months. So very pretty similar, despite these are two different individuals. But the surprising result is when we look also to the pattern. So what we found is that the, all these trace elements have a, a cyclical bounding. So we have period where there was a, a significant increase of this element distribution, and other period alternated with period with very low value. And we found this uh, a bounding in all the teeth that we analyzed. So in all four teeth uh, that we analyzed belonging to the different individuals. Uh, how do we interpret this? So what uh, our interpretation is that uh, uh, Australopithecus mother were breastfeeding the baby uh, for more than one year, uh, up to five years, four, between four to five years of age. And that's what we're doing this on the season level. So when it was seasonal, harsh season, when there was no food shortage, the mother would uh, compensate this by uh, heavily breastfeeding their baby. And these were alternated with season, with good season, where there was abundance of food. In that case, uh, the baby more heavily relied on the consumption of solid food. Um, and this is a, somehow uh, um, in agreement with previous study that look also on developmental stress in Australopithecus africanus. Uh, this is done by uh, um, measuring and frequency, measuring the frequency of linear and animal uh, hypoplasia, which is an animal defect that corresponds to episode of stress that can be nutritional, also environmental. Uh, and this study found that in Australopithecus Afri uh, 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 africanus, the frequency was very high, but not only the frequency, also the, the pattern seemed to coincide with the seasonal variation, probably with the period of uh, food shortage. So somehow our results uh, um, you know, agree very well with these studies. There has been also another study that used a similar approach uh, by uh, measuring the calcium isotopic composition of tooth animal uh, to provide the nursing behavior of uh, South African early hominids. However, this only look on the ratio, so it doesn't show the value, how the value change through time. The results suggest that early homo have a uh, a prolonged period of uh, uh, breastfeeding compared to Australopithecus africanus and Paranthropus robustus. And for that reason, they suggest that uh, uh, early homo have a more prolonged interbirth intervals. However, we think that they maybe probably misinterpret the results because uh, it's not only the short, relatively short period where the, uh, the predominance of, of breast milk, milk is important, but also if there are other in, interval or cyclical uh, uh, nursing that this also can prolong the interbirth interval. And we see this also in, in living apes. Uh, using the same approach that been analyzed in the dentition of a, a wild orangutan, and they found exactly our same results. So with the cyclical bonding of the, of the barium, uh, which suggests that this 
for example, in this case, this orangutan that they were breastfeeding up to nine years of age. We somehow correspond with what we know from uh, a direct observation. Uh, and why, why orangutan they were breastfeeding the baby for such a long period of time? Um, one of the reasons is that uh, uh, orangutan live in very uh, uh, unpredictable environment, which we have alternated period of uh, fruit abundance with very long period of, uh, especially during the dry season, uh, uh, where there is very low amount of uh, availability in food. During this period, the mother uh, of orangutan tend to, uh, of during food, uh, food scarcity, tend to heavily breastfeed in their baby. Uh, and these are alternated with periods where, um, when there is abundance of food, in the case of the baby uh, rely on solid food. Um, the problem, especially for orangutan, but also for other old Asian uh, apes uh, and African apes, is that by prolonging this period of time uh, of breastfeeding, that means also this have a huge impact on their reproductive rate, made it very low, meaning that any change in the demography of this uh, species can have a, a dramatic impact because it will take much longer to recover. And that's probably one of the main reasons why they are facing extinction. Uh, we also test with, uh, we have a one uh, orangutan uh, that were living in the zoo, it's called Sing Sing, from the, that was born in the uh, Singapore Zoo in 1975, uh, and then has been relocated in Perth Zoo. So what we found that we didn't find this uh, single gap banding of this trace element, which suggests that this uh, uh, orangutan were breastfeeding for the first year of life and then switched to solid food. This is also probably because uh, there are no food shortage in living in a zoo, uh, which is quite different from the wild orangutan from the previous study. And finally, we also have to mention about the behavior uh, and importance of alloparenting. Because one question would be, okay, you know, you have a very prolonged period of breastfeeding, uh, but maybe you can get help uh, from other member of the groups. Uh, in raising your uh, uh, your babies, but that seems not to be the case of both Asian and African apes. That's why I've written a jealous mother. So uh, alloparenting is extremely rare. Uh, female, like in this case of a chimpanzee, tend to spend all the time with the baby and doesn't allow other member of the groups to even get close to it. So the meaning is that all the uh, burden is carried by the mother. And only when the young become independent and stop breastfeeding, then the uh, uh, ape, in this case, the chimpanzee, can reproduce again. But what's about human? So here is called the grandmother, I call it non-hypothesis. Uh, well, in modern humans, actually, our parenting probably play a key role. Uh, because in, in this case, um, a mother, a young mother, can get help from other uh, female, like grandmother, siblings, and, and so on. And that this would help in reducing the, uh, uh, the time of, uh, of breastfeeding, in, in this case, uh, 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 nursing period, and then increase indirectly the reproductive rate of modern humans, and then so increase the demography. So this is a very fascinating hypothesis. Obviously, we need a little bit more data uh, about it. And finally, what would be next? Well, we want to use the same approach. Actually, we got uh, uh, an internal grant uh, because we want to see uh, the impact of climatic change on growth and development in mammals. In particular, we want to see if uh, uh, the climate change had any impact on the winning, uh, on, the, on the winning. So for that reason, we are sampling uh, both placental and marsupial uh, mammals that live in a very arid condition and see if we can find any detect any signal that is related to, to climate. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, and I'm open to questions later on when uh, at the end of the of the seminar. Thank you. Thank you, Luca, for your fascinating talk. It's very amazing. I mean, the, the data you can get, it in, um, the detail of the data, it's just amazing. Um, we'll have the questions at the end. So I'll introduce our second speaker, my dear friend, Mehmet Somer. Uh, Mehmet obtained his PhD in evolutionary biology from University of Leipzig at, and the Department of Evolutionary Genetics at Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology. He was a postdoc at the Partner Institute for Computational Biology at the Institute of Chinese Academy of Sciences 
and later at UC Berkeley. He joined the Middle East Technical University in 2013, where he's still an associate professor. He's the PI of Comparative and Evolutionary Biology Lab and also the Archaeogenomics Labs Lab. He published high profile research papers in Nature, PNES, Plus Biology. He successfully gathered many prestigious grants, including the European Research Council Consolidator Grant, which is one of Europe's most prestigious scientific support program. He also received many outstanding research awards, which I won't be able to mention here for time constraints. Um, Mehmet devotes a lot of his time on public outreach. He is actively involved in increasing awareness in anti evolution propaganda in Turkey. He's also among the founder members of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Society in Turkey and has been an executive member um, since it was established. And thanks to his tireless efforts, the society is now composed of a large network of ecologists and evolutionary biologists in Turkey and successfully organizes the Ecology Evolutionary Biology Symposium every year. Thank you, Mehmet, for joining us. Thank you, Ayşegül, for, yeah, I was a bit embarrassed uh, for the <laughs> too much flattering introduction, but I have to say um, when I started, we, we overlapped with the Aisha Gul for about five years. And uh, uh, so many of the stuff uh, actually we were doing together, both teaching and uh, research wise. Um, and I was indeed very sad when she left, but uh, I really still have hope that eventually we'll have uh, Aisha Gul uh, back as we really need uh, um, good population genesis like uh, Aisha Gül. Uh, yeah, so we've been, um, yeah, do, we, we, I started in Ankara in 2013 and uh, at the time, uh, as I was telling you, with, with uh, Aisha Gül, we, had, uh, we started collaborating with the ancient DNA group. I didn't uh, set the, up the group myself. It was uh, already established and we just uh, uh, joined forces and uh, our interest uh, since then has been mostly on the Neolithic transition, trying to understand the Neolithic uh, transition about 10,000 years ago uh, in this region. So this is modern day Turkey, uh, the Levant, as you can see, uh, this is Iran. Uh, so we're um, people started, uh, they, they shifted from the ancestral mobile hunter-gatherer lifestyle to uh, first sedentary life, living in villages and cultivating wild crops and eventually domestication of plants and animals and full-scale uh, sedentary uh, farming communities uh, that emerged. And uh, so, of course, uh, this has been uh, studied by archaeologists for over a century in detail. Gordon Child, who's from Australia, was uh, one of the pioneers of um, these studies into the Neolithic uh, revolution or transition. Um, but uh, recently, Ishtini has also been contributing uh, to uh, resolving some of the questions that archaeology and anthropology uh, could not uh, directly address. And so I'm going to show some of the results we've uh, had. Um, yeah, j just to be bear in mind, so the transition process itself, the, the establishment of full-scale agricultural uh, societies, it took many millennia. Um, and uh, it uh, a, a certain phase involved this, what's called a ceramic or pre-pottery Neolithic uh, societies, which were, uh, which weren't, uh, which didn't have full-scale farming yet, uh, domestic um, species were rare or not existent, but they were sedentary and they were doing some cultivation management and still uh, a lot of hunting gathering. Um, so I'll refer to this, uh, the difference is ceramic versus later coming ceramic full-scale farming distinction later. Uh, and uh, here's ju just to give you an idea about uh, what these people look like. This is a uh, reconstruction of uh, Çatalhöyük, a couple of hours south from uh, Ankara uh, in south central Anatolia. Uh, so th this is actually representing one of the most uh, fully developed versions of uh, these uh, uh, of these ceramic uh, villages. Uh, so they, they already had uh, uh, agriculture, different types of crops, 
uh, different uh, domestic animals, sheep, goat, um, cattle. Uh, and uh, yeah, it was a village of uh, probably a couple of thousand people, there's debate there, uh, but a, cr a crowded village with uh, many buildings, as you see, sharing um, walls, uh, kind of um, bees, uh, uh, kind of, yeah, uh, nest type of uh, place, very, very dense uh, uh, architecture. Uh, and inside the inside the building again a reconstruction of how um, the uh, buildings the houses looked like they had entrances um, from above from the roof they were also using the rooftops as a living space for food production for socializing probably um, it was a relatively egalitarian village we don't have any um, uh, public buildings for uh, interestingly despite the high uh, population density. Uh, we don't have evidence for uh, large-scale differentiation, any uh, systematic class resembling differences among uh, buildings. Uh, there are differences, but it's not the systematic where we, we could easily spot, uh, for instance, in later coming periods, you can easily spot the house of the rich or the elite. Uh, and the commoners, uh, that, that kind of pattern is not existent in Chataluk nor in most other uh, Neolithic villages, but does emerge in later coming millennia. And they also had the, this uh, nice custom of uh, burying their dead within the, uh, under the floors of uh, their houses. And uh, it's nice because uh, it allows us to um, collect the skeletons, so a sample of the population uh, while excavating. Um, and uh, this is not possible when people started burying their dead outside. Uh, it became difficult to find them. And sometimes in, in many villages with cemeteries outside, uh, we don't have the skeletons. Um, so these, uh, the Central Anatolian Neolithic uh, villages, like I showed, uh, and also earlier coming ones, uh, they, they were, in fact, uh, they, they weren't the first of their kind. Uh, uh, we have villages in the Levant and in, uh, in Mesopotamia, upper Mesopotamia and Zagros um, a, appearing even earlier. And these uh, groups, they were sharing, um, as we mentioned, uh, domestic crops, uh, domestic animals, uh, also many rituals like uh, this obsession with building their, um, sorry, bur burying their dead under floors. Uh, and also plastering, retrieving skulls, plastering them, playing with them, burying them back together sometimes with people uh, as represented here. Uh, so yeah, there is obviously some kind of cultural sharing. And uh, one question um, had been whether uh, this, uh, this cultural sharing um, might represent uh, people actually uh, from one region going out and colonizing some other uh, region and establishing farming villages there, which is what happened in the case of the European Neolithic. It turns out it was mainly a colonization, so mass uh, migration by uh, farming communities from coming from Anatolia, Egypt, uh, that uh, brought uh, farming into Europe. Uh, so the question is, uh, did such uh, such similar kind of uh, move, mass movement uh, occur? Uh, in the nilization of the this uh, so-called primary zone, the fertile crescent. And uh, to address this, we've been producing um, ancient DNA data from different sites and uh, combining them with published data. Uh, so in our well, in one of our recent uh, work uh, led by Arena Yaka, who was who finished her PhD recently with us, uh, she produced. Uh, um, ancient DNA data from Ashikla and the Chatuluk here. Uh, so Ashikla is an aceramic site, sedentary hunt together, again, uh, not full-scale farmer and Chatuluk I already had introduced to you. Uh, so she combined this with the published data, uh, the site names are shown here from Anatolia, from the Levant, both pre-Neolithic and Neolithic. You can see the timeline here. This is pre-Neolithic, these guys are. Um, pre-pottery and everything, and also the Zagros. So this is the available data 
here and we added these two. Um, so these are pretty low coded genomes for some individuals are uh, the data available is only, it only covers 0.02x, so 2% of the genome, but uh, that is still enough to, um, to resolve some questions uh, as uh, we, we're using genome-wide uh, millions of SNPs, so large numbers of polymorphism across the genome. So for questions whether this individual is, let's say, this uh, Ashikli individual of low coverage is uh, closer to Levant or to some other Anatolians, we can uh, test that, um, uh, yeah, test that reliably with the, even such low coverage uh, data. So 0.02x is uh, we're currently using as our minimum. <clears throat> um, okay, so when we um, put, compile the data and uh, we first uh, study the overall patterns of similarity across uh, these uh, different uh, communities, so genetic samples from these communities. And here we have Levantine groups, uh, Natufian, that is pre-Neolithic and uh, Neolithic groups, one individual here uh, from the Levant site uh, closer to Anatolians, but in general we have um, clustering, we have some you know, ge geographic, we see geographic uh, structure, um, Importantly, the Spinarbush individual is epipaleolithic, like about 5,000 years uh, before the uh, Neolithic started, uh, produced by uh, the Yena group. Uh, and uh, epip the, this uh, pre Neolithic uh, genome clusters together with the Neolithic genomes from Anatolia. In fact, the same in the Levant, uh, pre Neolithic and Neolithic groups uh, clustering together. Uh, and both, both these uh, distinct from uh, Zagros uh, genomes. So this overall suggests uh, pretty strongly that uh, Neolithic development across the region was mainly a local event. That is, um, uh, people were interacting culturally, uh, but there was no mass movement replacement of uh, populations such that uh, if that had been the case, then we would have uh, expected uh, the Panarbash genome to be different and perhaps uh, the Neolithic Anatolians to be more similar to Levant or uh, Zagros groups, but we don't so see such a pattern. Um, and th this was what the archaeologists had been suspecting for long, but uh, it's nice we can also confirm uh, this with genetic data directly. And uh, second, uh, uh, and uh, I, I should also briefly mention that uh, uh, we, we also checked whether over time there might be some degree of population exchange, some uh, gene flow among regions, and we do see evidence uh, for that. So uh, using this uh, so-called D-test where we ask, for instance, whether uh, groups from Levant are equally distant, genetically equally distant to aceramic and ceramic, uh, Anatolians uh, early and late. If there was no gene flow in the time that passed, we would expect no uh, asymmetry. Uh, but uh, if there was gene flow from Levant to, for instance, uh, into Anatolia, uh, then we might expect uh, Levantine groups to show higher affinity to ceramic uh, period Anatolians. Uh, and uh, that's in fact what we see, uh, this D statistic is showing that bias uh, where we see that both Levant and also to some degree Iranian Neolithic groups showing higher affinity to ceramic uh, groups from Anatolia. So suggesting that uh, it, from the aceramic to ceramic in that period, there was gene flow from uh, the Levant and from uh, somewhere in the east into Anatolia. Uh, there, there can be also other scenarios, but uh, this appears uh, a plausible one. Okay, um, now our other question uh, was uh, about how much the, uh, how much we can tell about social structure within uh, the, these uh, communities. And one aspect of social structure is uh, uh, we can uh, try to address by studying the relationships among these 
uh, co-buried individuals in inside buildings or inside or around buildings. So uh, the, the question of whether these uh, people buried together in the same graves, not necessarily at the same time, uh, many times graves are opened and new people are buried in uh, that archaeologists can discern. Uh, whether these were biological kin or not had been uh, a long-standing question and in fact using dental comparisons, comparisons of dental morphometry, uh, people had observed, had uh, tried to address this question and uh, Interestingly, they found in Chatoluk, where which has one of the largest sample sizes uh, among Neolithic um, uh, excavations uh, yet, uh, in Chatoluk they found no evidence for higher similarity among individuals buried in the same building uh, in, in their dental uh, morphology, and that was interpreted as perhaps um, the society not being uh, organized based on biological kinship rules, uh, which is, of course, very interesting, but uh, because dental morphometry is so noisy, um, we, people were still, uh, many, many people were still doubtful whether uh, this was a real result. So we tried to, um, we attempted to address this using genetics. Uh, in total, we scanned uh, 50 uh, co-buried pairs in Chatolik and also other um, village, uh, villages uh, in Ashiklu, Bonjuklu, um, and so on. Uh, out of these 50 co-buried groups, who so co-buried referring to buried somehow associated with the same space, same building, or on the same building, or neighboring buildings. Uh, among these uh, pairs, uh, uh, seven were first estimated to be first degree related and uh, one pair second degree related or second or third. Uh, we further attempted to uh, discern whether these were um, um, first degree related pairs were siblings or uh, parent offspring pairs by comparing using different uh, types of statistics, uh, including um, the autosome to X chromosomal kinship coefficient, which can be helpful uh, in discerning, for instance, uh, uh, mother daughter versus uh, sister pairs. Um, our coverage just being very low, this becomes a really challenging task, but uh, we did, uh, we, we compiled basically all uh, types of different. Uh, uh, different types of evidence uh, to, to come up with a most accurate uh, uh, description of relationships among these uh, groups, uh, am among these individuals. And I'll show you the results uh, on the um, site uh, maps here. So uh, here we have a and a ceramic site, uh, round buildings. So these were the primitive early types of uh, building, uh, people were uh, constructing, and two neighboring uh, buildings, as you see, uh, individuals buried here. So the ones with color have been genetically sampled, and we estimated these two females um, to be siblings and an adult and a child. And this old woman and this female child, again, uh, to be siblings. So uh, this individual had no uh, other relative in our sample. Um, Another case from Bonjuklihik, uh, again, Central Anatolia, East Ceramic Neolithic, two neighboring buildings, again, uh, two individual, two pairs of individuals who turned out to be uh, first related. We estimated these to be uh, siblings to a female and a male adult, and uh, a parent offspring pair, which uh, who, who we uh, estimated to be a mother son uh, pair. Uh, an interesting point here was this uh, perinatal baby buried within the same grave with this uh, young woman, uh, but who apparently had no uh, relationship between her or anybody else. Uh, so not everybody was obviously uh, closely related in this uh, group, but uh, we, we do find an element of um, biological kinship uh, among people buried in these houses. 
Um, of course, the question is whether these people were actually using these buildings. That's uh, the discussion, but at least with respect to burials, uh, there seems to be, uh, it seems as if biological kinship did have a role. But uh, what uh, you might find is already um, expected, but the picture changes when we uh, study uh, the um, ceramic period sites. Uh, most of our data come from Barjan and Chataluk, uh, which are from uh, around the same period. And here uh, we have the, the architecture has changed. We have larger buildings, uh, rectangular. And uh, also for some reason, which we are not 100% sure, most of our sample uh, comes from um, infants, which could be related to some DNA preservation issue. Uh, and uh, so you see here you see uh, three infants, for instance, uh, sampled from this building. One pair were siblings, another pair here, second degree relatives. But for instance, here among these four sub adults, uh, no relationship. And uh, here this one and this one also had no relatives. Similar picture in Chatalik, three buildings. Uh, we had one pair of siblings and no other uh, re relatives. Uh, and uh, overall, there seems to be a um, distinction between the early sites, uh, Islamic sites, Ashikla and Bonjuklu, uh, and what we see in Chatalik and Barjan, uh, in that the number of individuals who uh, have, have been sampled uh, with co buried individuals who uh, were identified to have relatives around them. Uh, this was much higher in Ashikla and Bonjuklu and much lower in Chatalik and Barjan. Our sample sizes are admittedly very small. This is basically all the data we have. Uh, and the, these are, uh, some of these are much larger sites. It could be that we might have been uh, unlucky uh, uh, but at the same time, I, I, I should note that what we see in uh, Chatalika and Barjan is consistent with what uh, anthropologists have been reporting based on dental data. So uh, it is not unlikely that uh, this pattern will hold with as more we produce more data. Um, yeah, so to wrap up, I think I'm running out of time. Is that correct? I should be, um, yes, a little bit, but yeah. But Okay, yeah, then uh, I just finish here. Oops, sorry, no, no breathing. Uh, basically, um, we, we find that kinship was common among, uh, biological kinship was, uh, seems to be common among co uh, in East Islamic sites, at least with the sample we have, but in later coming sites, for some reason, we find uh, biological kin much uh, less frequently, and this suggests perhaps some other types of kinship, social, uh, non-biological types of kinship might have played role. Um, yeah, we, we, there's a lot of room for speculation. Uh, one final point uh, I should make is that it's interesting that uh, adult sisters we were finding among co burials again, the sample size is very small, but if this pattern later holds, we might uh, infer that uh, perhaps patrilocality, which uh, becomes pretty, uh, prevalent in later coming uh, farming societies. Uh, patrilocality traditions might not have been established already very early in the Neolithic. Okay, and with that, uh, I will thank all people who contributed, uh, especially these people from Hajitip and Metu. So we're working at two neighboring universities and all the funding sources uh, and youth for listening, uh, the Aishigil and our uh, organizers from Adelaide, uh, thank you for the invitation again. Thank you, Mehmet. So great to see so many new- Sorry people. about running out of time. Oh, My, right. I, I, was, I couldn't keep track of that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, our third speaker is Joao Teixeira. Um, he also has a vast international research experience in world leading scientific institutions. After obtaining a degree in biology and master's in forensic genetics at the University of Porto in Portugal, he completed a PhD in evolutionary genetics at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany. After finishing he, 
his PhD. He became a postdoctoral fellow at Institute Pasteur in France, uh, studying the evolution of even immune responses in primate species. He then moved to ACAD uh, at the University of Adelaide. Um, he is now an ARC Decker Fellow with the School of Culture, History and Language at the Australian National University and an affiliate of the ARC Center of Excellence for Australian Biodiversity and Heritage. His research, which led to many high profile publications, combines population genetics, ancient DNA, bioinformatics, statistics, and anthropology to study the origin and evolution of human species. He's particularly interested in Pliocene human evolution, human population adaptation to environmental change, and the historical human migrations. Thank you, Joao, for joining us so early from Portugal. Uh, thank you, Ashtagul, and all the organizers for inviting me to present my work today. Uh, it's uh, really a privilege to be able to talk about uh, modern human encounters uh, within these events in, uh, in, in island Southeast Asia, uh, particularly considering that uh, most of this research was done while I was a postdoctoral fellow um, at the Australian Centre for, for Ancient DNA at the University of Adelaide. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really a privilege to talk about this topic. Um, in particularly considering that you know uh, the uh, theme of this symposium is to talk about uh, human origins, which has been like um, the question that has mostly uh, fascinated me for uh, a long time. And so to celebrate Darwin is 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 really a privilege, and particularly with this with this line of uh, of speakers as well. Uh, and I will I will just start by saying that even though this symposium is called uh, Our Origins. Uh, what, uh, as researchers, we're mostly uh, uh, sort of uh, condemned to uh, study uh, a process uh, of evolution rather than uh, the origin question, even though what might attract us um, to, to that in the first place is, is the question of origins. And I think uh, that's just pervasive in different scientific fields uh, in physics with people studying the origin of the universe or biologists studying the origin of life. People in working in human evolution often want to know the origin of mankind and how we came to be. Um, but we're, we're limited and we basically have to study a process um, in terms of, which is a fascinating process of evolution, but we're limited in time and we're limited often in space. And so uh, on that regard, in particular to the human species, I find that a period of uh, the Pleistocene, especially in the late Pleistocene, with the emergence of uh, so-called anatomically modern humans is a particularly interesting um, uh, topic to, to the research on. Uh, and so I've been focusing on the, uh, is, uh, my research in Adelaide has been focusing on the encounters between uh, modern humans and closely uh, extinct relatives, um, in particular, the elusive Denisovans. And, and so to go from that, I, I just wanna say that, um, to give you a picture of what sort of the world looked like uh, maybe 125,000 years ago. And as I said, this this. This could be this, this is not a random date in the sense that this is already post the emergence of anatomically modern humans in Africa, um, and it's it's predating um, the uh, the out of Africa event where modern humans went to colonize different parts of the planet. But this is more or less how, uh, based on a fossil record, uh, the world looked like um, in in the Pleistocene 125,000 years ago. So you'd have uh, anatomically modern humans emerging um, in Africa. Uh, evolving, this, this forms uh, uh, evolving in Africa, and then you'd have Neanderthals um, living in uh, Western, Western Eurasia, so mostly in Europe, uh, with Homo erectus fossils being documented in Eastern Eurasia, so mostly in, in, in Asia, particularly China, uh, but also in, in, in Southeast Asia. And so when modern humans went out uh, of Africa, uh, and I don't want you to think about a pilgrimage or something like this, but rather the process that is very complex. And this is going to be important later on when I talk about some of these um, in the discussion. But um, imagine that, you know, when modern humans went out of Africa, we've met or our ancestors met uh, different groups of humans, uh, which we're calling different species. Um, but these are different groups of humans. Uh, and we know uh, this is based on the fossil record and now based on genetics. We know that our species or our ancestors interbred with uh, some of these groups. And so I want to focus today on a region that I find particularly interesting. And I, I find it interesting because, well, first of all, I was in Australia trying to understand the arrival of modern humans to the continent of Sahul, which was composed by New Guinea and Australia uh, with lower sea levels, which I try, I try to represent here 
around 50,000 years ago. So you have lowered sea levels uh, that basically united the continental shelf of Eurasia uh, to the islands of Indonesia. So to Borneo, Java, and so on. So you have, uh, these, these were all connected um, by land around the time modern humans are estimated to have arrived in the region. And this is a particularly interesting region because uh, its biogeography is quite unique. Um, so you have the, uh, this, this, this line here, it's called the Wallace's line. It's one of the uh, strongest uh, biogeographic barriers uh, for the dispersal of terrestrial fauna. It's existed for millions of years and it effectively separates uh, them or it separated for a long time and it still does the continental shelf of Eurasia with the Indonesian islands with some of the Indonesian islands uh, to the west. So this is called the Sunda land, right? Uh, from the Philippines to the east and uh, other Indonesian islands, which form the, the archipelago of Wallacea, uh, to Sahul uh, to the west. Um, and this has been responsible for the diversification of uh, marsupials, for instance, and placental mammals. So this, this is quite a strong uh, maritime current. <clears throat> you have others uh, present there, like Ledeker's line, but Wallace's line is definitely um, the strongest. And what it has done also is that it has always kept these islands separated by sea. So in order to reach uh, Wallace and the island of, of, of Sulawesi immediately to its, uh, to its east, you'd have to cross um, uh, uh, open waters, uh, deep waters with strong maritime currents. However, we know that uh, humans and different human groups have inhabited this region for quite a considerable time. So we have evidence, first of all, for the presence of Homo erectus, which is a species that is thought to have separated from our own lineage around 2 million years ago. And we know we have documented uh, records of Homo erectus in the island of uh, Java for at least uh, 1.5 million years ago. We also have uh, two uh, recently discovered, described species of diminutive, uh, diminutive sized hominins, namely Homo floresiensis in the island of Flores, um, and Homo luzonensis uh, in, in the Philippines. And as I recently described, so this, this has been uh, known for uh, more or less 20 years in the case of Homo floresiensis, and while Homo luzonensis was only described in 2019. We also have a strong stone tool record showing human-like presence um, in this island. So we know that despite this being a, uh, a region that in order to reach, you have to cross open waters with strong maritime currents, we know that humans uh, have done so for several hundred thousands uh, of years, or close, closely, or close extinct relatives of humans have done so. Uh, but what, what, what makes it even more interesting, arguably, is that this region harbors the uh, highest amount of, or populations living in this area today, harbor the highest amount of the Nisevan uh, ancestry of anywhere in the world. And this is done, this is known since uh, 2011 with work by David Reich and Svante Pabo and others um, that have showed that the Denisovan, uh, using the Denisovan genome and Denisovan genetic information, we know that, uh, and looking uh, whether uh, worldwide populations had any signatures of that Denisovan ancestry, they found that uh, uh, island Southeast Asia and Sahul, so in particular Australia and New Guinea, had the highest amounts of, of Denisovan ancestry. And this is fascinating because Denisovans uh, were the first species to have solely been described based on ancient DNA analysis uh, from a pinky finger. Uh, from a, a bone on, the, on, on your pinky finger uh, that has been uh, found in a cave in Siberia in, um, in the Altai Mountains. And so we know that the Nisevans lived in Asia, but interestingly, uh, people from Southeast Asia and, and Australia and Aboriginal Australians and uh, New Guinea uh, Highlanders have the highest amounts of the Nisevan DNA. And so this region is located thousands of kilometers away from, from Siberia. And so there's sort of a very interesting pattern here where you have fossil record uh, indicating the presence of these deep, uh, deeply divergent human lineages that have, might have split from humans uh, around 2 million years ago. And this is based on morphological comparisons. And on the other hand, you have ancient DNA coming in and sort of showing that there's a much more recent um, human relative. So a species that uh, has split from, modern, from the modern human lineage much more recently, the Denisovans, which, is, which are a sister group to Neanderthals, uh, and have split around maybe 600, 700,000 years ago. So they're much, much more recent than the estimated splits for Homo erectus, Homo luzonensis, and, and Homo floresiensis. And so you have this sort of 
contrasting picture, right? Because it's not um, thought that, you know, these diminutive sized uh, uh, species like Homo floresensis, Homo luzonensis, or Homo erectus could represent uh, the Nisevans. So we, we wondered uh, whether because you have this uh, very rich um, fossil record and, and these two species, Homo luzonensis and Homo floresensis, at least have survived until the arrival of modern humans in the area 50,000 years ago. Perhaps Homo erectus has done so too, even though the uh, latest uh, date for Homo erectus presence in the region is around 100,000 years ago. So we wondered, could we have also signatures of super archaic integration? Then this means admixture between modern humans, incoming populations of modern humans, and other uh, documented fossil species in the region. So Homo, uh, homo floresiensis, Homo luzonensis, perhaps Homo erectus. The problem is we don't have the genomes of these fossils to look for. So we have to sort of find alternative ways to sort of try to uh, disentangle this question. And so what we did was uh, simply, so imagine that you have a human chromosome and then admixture happens with say Neanderthals or Denisovans. And the descendants of those uh, crossings or those interbreeding events will carry segments on the DNA that are the Nisevan or Neanderthal. And we can know this because we can compare it to say African populations, which are assumed not to have uh, had uh, Neanderthal and Denisovan uh, uh, ancestry. And so we can look at this compared to the Neanderthal and Denisovan genomes, and we can find these segments in, in, in the genome. But if you, we would have like super archaic ancestry, so ancestry from pre currently genetically unknown groups, uh, it's much harder to find uh, such evidence. And the conventional methods that look for interbreeding events or integrations, they usually rely on, the, on uh, the availability of genomes of reference for the archaic, so-called archaic extinct species, in this case, Neanderthals and Denisovans, which are the only two for which we have, we have the uh, DNA data. But uh, fortunately, there was a recent implementation by Lauret Skov, who's currently in Leipzig, um, who has um, developed this uh, hidden Markov model uh, method that can look for uh, regions of the genome that look uh, suspiciously uh, diverged from an African reference. So the idea is if, if you assume that African populations were not part uh, or their ancestors did not take part of these uh, interbreeding events between modern humans and other groups of humans in, in the Pleistocene, then you could basically uh, take every, every single variant that is seen in Africa, which is as the cradle of mankind has the highest genetic diversity of anywhere in the world, you could exclude that variation, and then you can look for regions of the genome that look unusually diverged from the African source. And then you can uh, do other sorts of things and try to sort of estimate whether those regions could represent um, uh, introgression events with, uh, uh, with super archaic sources, for instance. And so we've set up, uh, we were fortunate that for this particular question, there was a, there had been a recent paper by Guy Jacobs and Murray Cox and others uh, particularly people at the Eichmann Institute, um, uh, led by Era Sudoyu, who had uh, basically sampled uh, more than 400 um, or more than 160 uh, human ge uh, genomes from uh, island Southeast Asia, and compiled it with uh, a large data set of human genomes across the world, and looked for the needs of an ancestry in this region specifically. And they found uh, multiple uh, the needs of an ancestry, particularly in Papuans, and they proposed that this. Uh, in um, this, this Denisovan admixture happening uh, specifically in, in, in Papuans. So raising even further this question of uh, this discrepancy between genetics and, and the fossil record. And so we took this data, we've applied conventional methods. So we, we've, we've used Chromopainter and HMM, which they had done already in their paper. And then we, in addition to that, we ran this new method by Lauret Skov and tried to see whether beyond detecting Neanderthal and the needs of an ancestry in island Southeast Asia, we could also detect uh, evidence for admixture, perhaps with Homo erectus, Homo luzonensis, or Homo floresiensis. And so we did this by using these this, this, this different methods and then excluding the regions that were attributed to Neanderthal and the needs of an um, ancestry. So uh, perhaps interbreeding events with Neanderthals and Denisovans. And we, we were left with this uh, so-called residual archaic sequences. So this method basically detects everything. And then if we exclude Neanderthal and Denisovan segments, we are left with, the, uh, with an amount of residual sequences that we could sort of treat as candidate regions for uh, integration between uh, modern humans 
and perhaps one of the three species documented in the fossil record of, of the region. And so what we found is that I'm showing here on the y-axis, I'm showing you um, the estimated amounts of Neanderthal and the needs of an ancestry in different populations uh, across the world. So each dot represents an individual, and then you have the violin plot basically showing the distribution in the population. And so from left to right, we're going from basically west to east. Uh, and we have, you can see that we have uh, essentially uh, very similar amounts of Neanderthal and the needs of an ancestry uh, uh, all the way to Western Island, Southeast Asia. So this is, these are regions west of uh, Wallace's line. And so these are mainly driven by Neanderthal ancestry. And once you look at populations east of Wallace's line, sort of the amount of Neanderthal the needs of an ancestry jumps. Uh, and this is caused by the needs of an ancestry that so as I've shown you in, the, in those previous plots that had been documented and when we sort of recapitulate that. So we found more the needs of an ancestry in uh, regions east of Wallace's line. Right? With, with, with Indonesian islands being sort of intermediate between what you see in Papua and Australia and what you see west of uh, Wallace's line. When, if you then look at the so-called unknown regions, so these regions that were left over, these residual archaic, putative, putative archaic uh, sequences, uh, there's very little differences uh, across different populations in the world. And more, more so, you, the amount of these regions is much, much more decreased. Right, so this is already an indication that unlike what you observe with Neanderthals and the Nizamans, where there seems to be additional pulses in particular populations, uh, in, in specifically the needs of an ancestry in, in, in Papuans and Australians, uh, you don't see this if you look at residual archaic sequences. So already the amount sort of argues against um, the existence of super archaic introgression in island Southeast Asia. But sort of further going into details, so what we've done is that we looked specifically on those residual archaic sequences to try to see if we could find evidence from mutation patterns that were compatible with uh, admixture between, uh, say, Homo floresiensis is, is in the Stoy example, and, and the ancestors of, of Australians or Papuans. So what happens if you have a phylogenetic tree, and given the deep uh, uh, estimated split times for Homo floresiensis, Homo erectus, or Homo luzonensis, you'd expect that if, in case there was admixture, because of the deep evolutionary times that would result in different mutations seen in this species as compared to the inner groups formed by Neanderthals, the Nisevans in this case, and then modern human populations in another, uh, where the split was, would be much more recent or is much more recent, then you would expect that if uh, admixture had occurred, if introgression had occurred, this would result in a pattern of an excess of derived mutations. So mutations that would be different in the receiving population compared to other modern human populations, but also to Neanderthals and the Nisevans. So this would result in the patterns of this like, you'd have derived alleles uh, coded as one uh, and ancestral alleles coded as zero. So you'd have an, a, a difference in excess in these regions of ones of patterns that would be like one, zero, 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 or zero, one, 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 right? And so we looked for this in, in the different populations that we've, we've analyzed. And what you see is that there's, there, are, there seems to be subtle differences again. So the y-axis shows you the proportion of these, uh, what we call mutation motifs within each residual segment. Uh, and you have this zero, one, one, ones, and these one zero zero zeros. So basically here, uh, where this would indicate potentially um, super archaic uh, admixture. And what you see is that there's subtle differences between populations, um, but the proportions are also very different between themselves. So you'd have uh, for one zero zero zeros. So this is the individual carrying the residual archaic sequences it has a uh, derived allele where everybody else has a, an ancestral allele. This is about 26 to 28%. Whereas for the other cases where the putatively uh, receiving individual has an ancestral allele and everybody else has a derived allele, uh, the proportions are uh, much lower. And so what we do then is that we try to correlate. Uh, we see if there's any correlation between the amount or the proportion of these motifs and known ancestry of that particular individual. And what we find is that there is in fact um, a positive correlation between uh, uh, patterns of 1000 and the needs of an, and Neanderthal ancestry and a negative correlation uh, for the 0111 motifs. So this sort of suggests that the proportion of these motifs is being led not by super archaic ancestry, so those residual motifs which were already suspected did not show anything. Already uh, uh, on top of that, the mutation motifs 
show that these patterns are correlated with known uh, the needs of an ancestry. So this could result actually from spillover of the needs of an Neanderthal ancestry that the conventional methods are not being able to detect, but the new method is able to detect so effectively. But to confirm this, we then ran coalescent simulations and we show basically we run four different coalescent models. So these are models with human demography. Uh, and then we sort of add to the model different amounts of super archaic ancestry. And we, I, I'm showing you here uh, the estimates if we, if we assume a 2%, 1%, 0.1%, so very low amount of superarchic admixture or no superarchic admixture at all, what are the expected motifs within these residual sequences? And what you can see is that the models uh, with zero or 0.1% superarchic admixture are the ones that are more compatible with the observation. So in, in empirical data, we have, a, we have about five to 6% of 0111. Uh, for, uh, and that's more or less what we have in the coalescent simulations for 0 and 0.1% 0 super archaic admixture, and analogously for 1000, which is about 26 to 28%. So overall, this suggests that there's no evidence for super archaic introgression in Ireland, Southeast Asia, right? And we, 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 for the first time, we sort of address this question quantitatively, and I, and I think I want to emphasize that. But this raises then the question, so you have all these fossils, uh, you have all these Denise of an ancestry, you have evidence, accumulating evidence, and we had a paper also in 2019 showing that already the patterns of Denise of an ancestry were suggestive of different admixture events in the region. Uh, you have then this, this, the paper from Guy Jacobs and Murray Cox suggesting that Denise of an admixture occurred in, uh, locally in island Southeast Asia. And there's more, there's a recent paper in Nature just out this year suggesting that maybe this is happening in the Philippines as well. But there's this disconnection between Denise of ans uh, and the needs of an ancestry and the super archaics that are present. And the problem is the amount of the needs of an fossil record is very, very limited. So we have a few teeth, uh, we, we, we have a jawbone, uh, there's maybe a skull that was just described last week, but we don't really know what the needs of an is supposed to look like, nor do we know how diverse morphologically they were. What we know is that they are more recent um, the split from Denisovans and modern humans is more recent than the two million years estimated for any of these of these groups based on the fossil record. But maybe we're wrong. Maybe so. So and, and, and some of us we disagree. Like I think that maybe we're looking at uh, Denisovans and just not being able to identify them. That that's a possibility. At least the southern version of the Denisovans. Uh, but it's also possible that a major uh, archaeological finding is or has to occur is about to occur in. in in island Southeast Asia. And one place to look for, we think, could be uh, Sulawesi. And the reason, this is, this is reasoning by Chris Helgen, this, this is his work for our paper. And we, we, what we've done is that we correlated the amount of the needs of an ancestry and the, the, the existence of uh, stone tools and fossil records in different islands in Wallacea, including the Philippines. And we see that everywhere where you have survival, late survival into the Holocene of megafauna, and you have pigs, uh, for instance, in the Philippines and buffalo, uh, and you have the Komodo dragon on Flores. Uh, these, are, these are islands where human-like presence has been, uh, um, taken, has been there for several hundred thousand years. Uh, the only other place where that occurred and megafauna didn't go extinct into the Holocene is Sulawesi. And we, we have stone tools in Sulawesi dating at least for 200,000 years. So maybe the Nizavans, uh, the southern Nizavans are present in, in Sulawesi, but we, we, we still don't know. Uh, and yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot of questions, uh, more than answers, but I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave it here and, and, and take it to the, uh, to the discussion. And thank you again for the invitation. Thank you. That's fascinating. I mean, it's still a big puzzle that remains to be unsolved, which, which is very exciting. Um, so I'll <clears throat> see the chat line if there are um, questions. Um, sorry. Right. Um, so all the speakers can join as well and ask each other questions as well while I try to find the questions that are asking the chat line. Um, so I have one I for I yeah. Have questions for Luca. Mm -hmm. So, yes, yeah, sh sh shall we have questions for Luca? Yeah. Oh, the, the first one is, yeah. All right. So, for Mehmet, uh, if it is the case that patriarchality has not developed in the relatively small populations of early Neolithic farming communities, 
Would this be detectable by inbreeding measures such as runs of homozygosity? Adam asks you. Yeah, th thank you for the uh, question. Let, let me see. So, um, so to, to distinguish patrilocality versus matrilocality, or I forgot the word, I mean, uh, equal, equal ch chance of the man or the woman uh, staying with the, with the family. Uh, I, I guess the, this another approach we hope to use um, is to compare diversity, genetic diversity of males and females. Of course, uh, one can also use uh, isotope information, uh, strontium, which has been used in the context of uh, Neolithic uh, Europe, uh, Neolithic and Bronze Age Europe. Um, and with respect to runs of homozygosity, now, I'm not sure if it could be possible, but <laughs> now I cannot be sure how exactly we would be uh, using runs of homozygosity to uh, to identify. Perhaps like runs of homozygosity on autosomes versus X chromosome could could, could be. I have to think about that, uh, but it could be an approach, again, to distinguish um, beyond, uh, in, beyond, in general, small population size and inbreeding patri versus matri locality, it, it could be a good approach. Yeah, th th thank you. I have to think about that. <laughs> um, thank you. <laughs> I'll um, read through the questions. Um, Bastian has a question. Yeah, Luca, um, I, I was just wondering, do you have any estimate like of, of the age at winning and the, the interbirth period as well for Neanderthal and, and Denisovan? Because you, you look at like, you know, deep ancestry in the human lineages, but I don't know if you had to look at as well at Neanderthals and Denisovans. Denisovans has not that many teeth anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't do the study. I think Tanya Smith was your guest uh, speaker a few weeks ago. Um, mm. she, did analyze, she did analyze Neanderthal. And uh, it seems that they uh, look very similar to modern humans in terms of age of winning. But also with modern humans and with these relatively late humans, I would also take into account the buffer, uh, uh, cultural buffer, uh, because, you know, I, I believe it probably, oh, even in Neanderthal, other members of the group were helping to raise the, the kids. So this, uh, the interbirth interval has probably make more sense if we look on uh, species like in apes, where there is no that cultural uh, things. Although I have to say that also in, in cercopy design, there is alloparenting is quite successful. Uh, in terms of Denisovans, I don't know. Uh, I know that there are a few isolated uh, teeth. A mandible maybe from, uh, from Tibet uh, would be nice to see uh, if you can record this information. Uh, well, maybe one day, who knows. So would, would you like to ask Mehmet as well? Your, your next may, may I ask uh, Luca a question be, be, so before? Far. Yeah. Uh, from what you described about the captive orang um, being well-fed and uh, having shorter weaning time, is it possible that to use food provisioning for wild orangs to, to you know, uh, reduce their weaning times and uh, increase population size for, to... to um, I don't know, play uh, with evolution. Uh, I don't know if it okay. is, would, be, would be possible. And also I think that the society of uh, orangutan is very different, uh, kind of semi-solitary. Uh, so I wouldn't interfere. <laughs> With the biology of this species in that case. Uh, I think in that, you know, we can change now. I mean, it's probably too late. Maybe the only things we can really do is try to preserve their environment. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah. That's... As much as we can. I don't know. Uh, and also, I don't know uh, really if it would be, that's probably some Rangon that really live in very remote area. Uh, so, I don't know. I don't, really don't know how to answer the question, but I would probably leave the nature to do their course in this case. Thank you. 
we have one more question for Mehmet. Um, yeah, Mehmet. Um, yeah, I, I, I saw your question, but yeah. uh, briefly, yes, that, that's something um, the archaeologists are considering that there are cultures with child adopt cross adoption across families is uh, pre pretty standard. And um, one idea is that perhaps uh, in these uh, societies, uh, this type of culture might have evolved perhaps to uh, to to consolidate community ties uh, perhaps it could have helped uh, it uh, could have helped mitigate social stresses related to you know developing um, well farming and accumulation of wealth uh, in its very incipient stages as I told you these were pretty egalitarian societies from what we can tell from the material culture and it could have been that they, they developed these uh, these traditions to 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 equalize uh, to to consolidate uh, a more egalitarian uh, patterns or relationships, but uh, but yeah, of course it's all speculation about war. There's no there there is limit very limited evidence for um, for uh, I would say intercommunity or intercommunity. Uh, violence the, the, there are uh, the, there are skeletons with uh, evidence for you know broken skulls or uh, uh, be, being hurt and then uh, who, who somehow survived but it's much more rare compared to later coming uh, later periods in the calculithic in the bronze age systematic violence becomes very evident. Uh, it's in, in these Neolithic societies in Anatolia, at least in late Neolithic in Europe might also be different, but Neolithic in Anatolia, you have very limited evidence of systemic violence. Hi, sorry, I have one question to Mehmet. Um, would you comment on how and why the difference of this ceramic culture spreading from you Euro in Europe versus the Anatolia, like the patterns, because it's not a sort of mass movement of individuals, but it's sort of localized. And um, why, why do you see different patterns? Uh, you, you mean, so, so, so I, I might be, I might have uh, mixed things up. So, so what I was trying to show was uh, is ceramic to ceramic differences within Anatolia and mm -hmm. not, not uh, Europe. So, so the, the pattern in Europe is more movement of individuals, right? Due to yes, it there is no is ceramic Neolithic in Europe. So, oh, in, right. so it's just it, spread from. It's just yeah. So so when the ceramic period appears in Anatolia, Mesopotamia, that's also the time when these movements to the west start. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, full-scale farming, pottery, and this westward movement, they come more or less around the same time. That's what we see. And we'll... Yeah. Um, there's another question um, for Joao. Um, do we know if the South Asian hominin non spot equates to multiple ancient human migration events out of Africa, or are some of them likely descendants from an earlier migration event by Erectus? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I should have, uh, should have mentioned that. So there's different, uh, I would say, theories um, uh, for, for Homo luzonensis and Homo in particular. Um, the idea is, so there's, there's people who favor the hypothesis that they are descendants of Homo erectus that just moved into the islands and then the island evolution takes over and so there's reduction in body size and shape and so on. So that's one hypothesis which would place their divergence to modern humans around two million years ago. Uh, and then there's the other hypothesis that actually they represent earlier, uh, a migration from an earlier uh, uh, form of uh, hominin uh, that's even uh, more diverged from um, uh, modern humans than, than Homo erectus is. And that has to do with the very unique morphology of, of these uh, hominids. I, I should say that um, for Homo luzonensis, the authors in the paper sort of leave it open because the morphological traits are quite uh, different. And so some suggest there are more archaic sort of traits and others more modernized um, traits. So, but in terms of leaving Africa, I guess 
Uh, right now, you could say that modern humans left Africa eventually, that uh, Homo erectus left Africa, uh, Neanderthals perhaps, but you, this, we're getting to a point where there's this, um, so we're, we're using genetics and uh, the fossil record and sort of paleoanthropology and try to piece everything together. And we still have to come up with methods and models that are uh, very unsophisticated, right? So we assume that there's this clean, so there's origin, points of origin and there's this clean migrations, right? And the process is much more likely uh, a very complex one where, uh, I mean, people just move around a lot. Uh, so, you know, uh, it's very hard to sort of pinpoint uh, interbreeding events, even in the case of Southeast Asia, even though I'm convinced that the, this, this the needs of an admixture happening in loco. I mean, it's very, it's very difficult to, to sort of estimate how many out of Africa events there were. And, and we don't really know how these processes could then impact the estimated divergence, genetic divergence between uh, different groups as we're seeing it from, from ancient DNA. So like to sort of put everything together in terms of paleoanthropology and ancient DNA will still take time. And I, I, I would say that uh, simplistic models are just gonna be abandoned um, in 10 years. Um, there's another question in Q&A for Joao. Um, is ancient DNA is so badly preserved in Wallacea, do you think testing paleoproteomic approaches might be a way to go? Yeah, I wish I was an expert in paleoproteomics and then, then I could do this research myself. But uh, Mehmet would be able to do the, to speak about this more, more ably than me. Um, the, the reason is, uh, and Bastion as well, the reason is uh, the tropics are very bad for preservation because of humidity and heat and so on. And so uh, Wallacea is you know, in the tropical region, so it, it becomes very problematic for DNA preservation. Uh, there's also the problematic of... Uh, wanting to sample uh, or destroy some of these of these fossils. Uh, but I think people will go or are going and I, I don't know, but uh, people might be going already for paleoproteomic. And I know homophotosynthesis people have tried and, and not be success, success, were not successful at it. So, yeah. Thanks. There, um, Luca would you like to ask a question. I yeah, I want to ask a question to Mehmet is if the kinship uh, difference between uh, older and rarely younger community was related to the po uh, population side of this community. It's a very good point that the reviewers also uh, point out. Yeah, of course, the early communities were much smaller. So in, with our current sample, we can't yet uh, rule out the possible effect of um, uh, total population size. Um, but yeah, it, we're producing more data. So I guess eventually we could do some simulations to see like how much random this, uh, this amount of relatedness versus non-relatedness could appear given certain population sizes. But yeah, currently our sample is too small. Thank you, it's a very good point. Um, I have another question yeah. for Jean. Um, I cannot hear you, Bastian. Sorry. Uh, no, you, you should hear me now. <laughs> yeah, you're talking about the Nisov ancestry in, in Sahu populations uh, or populations uh, east of the uh, West East line. Uh, but I know the answer, but I mean, could you just tell people actually that, you know, the Nisovan, uh, the, the Nisovan genome from the Altai region, you know, is, is one genome and how many flavors of the Nisovans actually are present in the genome of those um, Sahu people? Yeah, I mean, we know that there's at least two, there's evidence for at least uh, interbreeding events with two distinct populations. I mean, I would caution there in the, uh, I mean, again, we try to build models. I try myself to fit models <laughs> that are very archaic uh, for this problematic, but, you know, we sort of tried to come up with an idea of how many interbreeding events there were with how many different Denisovan like populations or whatever. Uh, there's evidence for, I mean, right now we think, and this can change, but we think that there's a, an Eastern or, or East Asian Denisovan. So that's the Altai sequence genome. And then there's at least uh, another distinct population, the so-called Southern Denisovans, which might have interbred with, with um, the ancestors of contemporary people in, in Southeast Asia and, and Sahul and so on. Um, so at least two, I would say, maybe more. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a, a, as we keep sequencing, we'll just, I, as I said, I think simplistic models will be abandoned. And I think we're gonna see this as a much more 
complicated network of gene flow throughout maybe I would say at least a million years, maybe more. And so I, I, and so we'll have to rethink. Um, mo simple models are, are are great, and 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 you know they allow us to test things, but they are almost always wrong, and we know that to start with, but we we have to still do it. Um, and so, and I think uh, uh, Ben had a question like uh, about uh, whether there's going to be another attempt at Homo floresiensis uh, sequencing. I mean, I think he's in Leipzig at the moment, so he he could actually answer his own question. I think better than myself. Um, uh, we certainly, <laughs> I certainly won't do it, but I think I think it should. I, I would love for this for this genomes to be sequenced. I mean, I think uh, maybe we'll get a, a lot of a big surprise. I mean. I'm at the moment, I can say this, at the moment I'm open to for Homo fluorescensis and Homo luzonensis genome, just give any sort of uh, divergence to modern humans. I, I, I will be, I think everything is possible, to be honest. So let's see, hopefully. Cool. Well, I think we are almost out of time. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Luca, Mehmet, and Joe. It was thank great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your fascinating research. It's so great. Uh, to hear. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And if you want to join us back in August, that'd be great. And we'll continue our talks on human evolution. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. So, Adam.